The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and today uh, we are speaking with uh, an author, producer, all around uh, man of the scene. He's done everything. We've got quite the history here, so uh, glad to have him here. Uh, Gabriel Rotello, thank you for being here. Hey, Al, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Wow. So, uh, you know, uh, getting into uh, your history, you've, you've sure done a lot of things. Um, where, where did, but you know, of course, we have to go to where it all started. And uh, what was what was the beginning for you for journalism? Um, actually, the beginning for me for journalism was founding uh, Outweek magazine in 1989. Before that, I had been a um, musician and a music producer in New York, and I had joined ACT UP in the late 80s. Um, wondering what I could do more for AIDS activism than just, you know, belonging to ACT UP and raising money and going to demonstrations and all that kind of thing. And one day I was walking down the street and saw the New York Native, which was the local New York City gay newspaper in those days, um, on a newsstand. And it just struck me. The Native had gone off on this tangent where they didn't believe that HIV was the cause of AIDS. It had become sort of almost like a cult thing. Nobody was really reading it. And as a result, New York, which was the largest you know, gay population and the epicenter of the AIDS epidemic, did not have a publication um, addressing those things. And it just suddenly hit me, oh, my God, what if somebody started a new gay publication, you know, LGBT publication, AIDS publication, in New York that addressed what was going on right now, um, LGBTQ liberation and AIDS activism and all that stuff. And that's what I could do. Of course, I was totally and completely unqualified to do it. I had never written anything and had no journalism background. But there were a lot of people in ACT UP and in the activist community who were brilliant and had um, a lot of experience doing things like that. So I ended up just sort of acting like a catalyst and putting it together. I teamed up with a, a, an investor, AIDS activist, Kendall Morrison. Um, we raised the money, much of which was his, and we started Outweek Magazine. And so that was how I started in journalism. It was the first edition came out on Gay Pride of 1989, and immediately the publication just took off and um, that's how it started. Wow. Do you know that um, in 1989, so this is 31 years ago, and I think a lot of the, um, man, it did time fly. I, I don't think a lot of young people that are, you know, around, out and about today even know what it was like to live in the 80s, you know, Ronald Reagan and denial of AIDS and 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 all of the things going on. Uh, even ACT UP. What, so what was ACT UP about in 1989? ACT UP had formed, I think it was 87. Um, it, it grew out of a speech that Larry Kramer gave in the um, Gay and Lesbian Community Center in New York in which he argued that the AIDS world needed an activist group, a protest group, that would target the government and target the media and stage demonstrations like in the glory days of the civil rights movement, et cetera, um, centered around combating the AIDS epidemic. At that particular time, that was really the beginning of the peak of the AIDS epidemic. People who had been in denial up until that point could no longer be in denial if you lived in a city like New York. People were getting sick left and right. If you knew a lot of people, your phone rang every few days. You're not going to believe it that so-and-so just died. So-and-so is in the hospital. They just put so-and-so, you know, on a respirator, you know, whatever. It was, it was a nightmare, and people were shocked and were spending most of their time doing caregiving, you know, meals on wheels, bearing witness, all of those kinds of very, very important things. That's what most AIDS groups were about. But Larry argued that there needed to be a protest group that would target 
drug companies and the government and the city of New York, etc. And the following Monday was the first meeting. There was a demonstration just a couple of weeks later uh, down on Wall Street uh, against, I think it was Burroughs Welcome, a drug company that was price gouging. I think that was the first demonstration. And from then on, it just took off, and ACT UP became enormous uh, and then spread all around the country. There were branches everywhere. And for the next five years or so, I would say, the um, – the LGBT world was to a very significant extent dominated by the news that was generated by ACT UP. And it worked, by the way. Yeah. And to this day, many people claim that in 1996-97, when the combination antiretroviral therapies came out and, um, and dropped the death rate um, from HIV to from almost 100%, down to a very, very low level, that that would not have happened as quickly as it did happen had it not been for ACT UP. Do you associate this, like, now today with COVID and all this, do you think that, um, do you think it's something we need again? Do we do we need stronger, more ACT UP style left groups out there? You mean to fight COVID? Yeah, well, not just not just COVID, but just the way, um, just the way the politics has gone so right and evangelical so much, and um, the focus has been more on, on protecting, uh, you know, religious liberties, let's say, rather than human rights. Right. Well, I mean, I think that at different times, different um, different causes come to the fore. Right now, the Black Lives Matter cause seems to be the thing that has captured people's imaginations in a mass way around the country um, and that you know that wasn't the case ten years ago or five years ago but it is the case now because certain things happened so um, and people is when it comes to HIV AIDS people don't really seem to care that much about it anymore because it doesn't it's not as fatal as it used to be so you know, I, I would tend to support, you know, any activist movement that tried to combat the terrible place that we're in right now. But you kind of, I think you kind of have to go with the flow. And right now, you know, Black Lives Matter is, you know, is, seems to be the cause that has, you know, garnered the most um, passion and enthusiasm. But people have tried to um, to create a sort of COVID act up. And there are Facebook pages and um, various web pages and things like that that um, people have set up to try to garner some of that old activist um, enthusiasm and direction towards combating the COVID epidemic. I just wonder, do you, do, do you find, so the people that were opposed to something like um, ACT UP or just the whole gay world in the, in the 80s, as compared to now, do you think that it's the same type of um, how do you, I, I don't I don't want to say hate, but the same type of resistance that Black Lives Matter is facing now? Yeah, it's, I think it comes from a very similar thing, a conservative impulse that people who have power and people who have privilege don't want to give it up and see any sort of change in that direction as a threat to them there was a period in the 80s when it seemed to people like that that the main threat was coming from the lgbt world and demands for equal rights from gay people and that you know continued right up to the victory of um, gays in the military and the victory of same-sex marriage that seems to have abated a little bit now not, not that much but it's no longer I mean, we won those big battles. So we're no longer in the streets fighting to end the ban on gays in the military because we ended it. And we're no longer in the streets fighting for same-sex marriage because we have same-sex marriage. So they're not, you know, freaking out that much about us, or it doesn't seem that way, freaking out that much about us right now because they don't see us out there agitating to a significant extent because on some of the biggest issues we already won. But with Black Lives Matter, 
they do see people agitating because of just the sheer horror of the constant assault on, um, you know, on people of color, particularly, you know, young men of color or men of color in our country that is continuously captured on videotape um, and the demonstrations that, you know, come of that. And then you've got a racist and avowed racist in the White House surrounded by a team of racists. And so it's a very, you know, it's a very fraught moment. But, yes, I think that the, the, the ultimate motivation is... It stems from the same thing, from privileged people who always, the world was always set up the way that favored them, um, fearing that that's no longer going to be the case and wanting to fight against it. Yeah. Mm. And I always wonder where, like when you were talking about the uh, the opposing paper um, to Outweek about... Um, you know the theory that aid you know hiv didn't lead to aids and all that and and now there's all this uh covid doesn't exist it's a hoax and all that stuff uh, do, does it concern you at all that there's a lot more conspiratorial thinking that actually has control of, of a lot of people like there's a lot of people out there now that believe that we haven't been to the moon the world's flat you know there's no covid it's uh, George Soros is hiring people to fake their deaths, you know, all this stuff. But there's a, yeah. lo there's a lot of that, right? Uh, maybe we see it more with the Internet. But it was going on back when, when AIDS was, was a new, uh, new, new virus for us. So, but I, I just don't know how, to, how, do you, how do you deal with something like that? Well, I see that as a general... Um, anti-science strain that runs through American conservatism in particular. I would compare that to the denial of global warming and the idea that we don't need to worry about that, that there can be a technological fix to it, and that anybody who talks about global warming is really only saying that because they hate industry and they want to tear it down they hate capitalism and want to tear it down we saw that even earlier um before uh, climate change became a big concern with things like air pollution and water pollution and protecting the environment and you know not chopping down the forests and not dumping raw sewage into rivers and all that kind of thing in the 60s and 70s when we had earth day um, those were seen by anti-science conservatives as excuses to enact a liberal agenda and that we were twisting science in order to enact a liberal agenda. And I think that the reaction to COVID is the same thing. You know, people feel that Trump was, you know, heading towards very probable re-election because the economy was doing fine and then suddenly this comes along and completely trashes the economy and um, you know makes Trump look very bad now it looks like he's going to lose the election and that anti-science that suspicion of expertise suspicion of science put together with that has led people to think that this is all just a hoax with so the thing that we have different today that we didn't have even back in Act Up days was um, Fox News, was the fact that people, if you are quite conservative, um, you literally just live in a completely different information environment from everybody else. Back in those days, you know, everybody watched the same three nightly news shows. On the, you watched Walter Cronkite or you watched you know, Tom Brokaw. Everybody read the same newspaper. If you lived in L.A., you read the L.A. Times. If you lived in New York, you read the Daily News or the New York Times or the Post. Everybody got their information from the same place, and then people argued about what it meant, and they had different interpretations of, of the facts, but the facts were the same facts, basically. And now, with, um, with the rise of Fox News in particular, it sort of started with conservative talk radio, but then really blossomed with Fox News. People live in completely and totally different informational worlds. I mean, you really, you can watch something going on in the real world, 
and go, oh, my God, I wonder how they're dealing with this over on Fox because this is so devastating to the conservative agenda uh, or to the Trump agenda or whatever. And then you switch over to Fox News to see how they're dealing with whatever it is that happened that day. And they're not even talking about it. They're talking about Hillary Clinton needing to go to jail. They're still talking about Benghazi. They're talking, you know, it's just a completely, totally, 100% different environment. And if that's all you watch, and if that's all you listen to, um, that's, you know, you're just going to be coming from a completely different place. So now with COVID, they're all getting, oh, it's not really that bad. It's all being exaggerated. And Trump's doing a great job. And, you know, hydroxychloroquine is actually really good and all that kind of thing. And um, it's a catastrophe. I mean, it really is a catastrophe. And it's going to continue even after Trump leaves office because he may be going places, but, you know, Fox News is still going to be there. So it's really, it's, it's as bad as I've ever seen it in my lifetime, for sure. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, you can get rid of Trump, but there's still that base. Uh, they're still there. They're still alive. They're still functioning, and it's not going to change, you know. Yeah, and the idea that there should be a technological fix. The, the other thing, of course, is that in order to fix COVID and to do what the successful countries around the world have done, you have to take personal responsibility and you have to be willing to um, bear a significant amount of social and economic pain and do things, not just think about yourself as an individual, but think about the collective. And that seems to be anathema to American conservatives. I mean, you see a little pushback about things like that in Europe and in Asia, but not very much. Most people, you know, get that when something like this happens, everybody has to pull together and follow the rules. But there is this strain of paranoia in American conservatism that um, th that is just not well suited to dealing with a crisis like COVID. It really isn't. Yeah, it's pretty unusual. I've been stationed up here uh North, I'm in. I've been in Canada now this year, <laughs> and uh, just the way it's uh, been dealt with here, like in the West, it was just a shutdown, and things pretty much fell into line real quick. Um, yeah. And to watch what's going on across the border has been insane, and and even to see it just on our own Canadian news and and the BBC, and you see kind of the the things being said and done, it. it it's it's really it's I, I feel embarrassed. Yeah, it's it is embarrassing, and it has um, it is damaging the United States in ways that will redound for far, far, far into the future, um, in many in in economic ways, social ways, health ways, all sorts of ways. Even if it ends tomorrow, even if they announce some therapeutic that really works tomorrow, the damage has been done. Um, so, but you know, it's not the first time. Epidemics are always political events, as well as medical, biomedical events. They all going all the way back: the plague of Athens, the plague of Justinian, the plague of Cyprian, the Black Death, plague of London. They always have been political events, and and AIDS was a tremendously political event. Uh, and we, I have to say, as I'm sure you probably know, in the gay world, we did not successfully um, deal with the AIDS epidemic in terms of prevention. The AIDS epidemic is still going on. People are surprised to learn that, you know, when I wrote Sexual Ecology in the late 90s, there were about 38,000 new uh, HIV infections in the United States each year. And today... 23 years, I guess it is, later, there are about 38,000 new HIV infections per year. Um, the attempt to deal with HIV through prevention and to bring the what's called r naught down below one and keep it there so that each sort of disease generation would be smaller than the last one and eventually the epidemic would just die out um, was not successful in the gay world. We have not been able to accomplish that. And um, so it's not, you know, it's not just COVID. 
There right. have been you know failures across the board. Well, so when you wrote that book, um, and and even how you compare it to today, uh, what was what do you think the biggest issue with people is that that we're still getting that many infections per year? Well, I mean, when you when you look at an epidemic. Uh, of human-to-human disease transmission, which is what we're talking about with COVID and with HIV um, and with measles and with all sorts of other things. There's three factors that determine what what you want to do is you want to bring the rate of new infections down below the point, what's called you want to bring R0 down below one, which simply means you want to bring the rate of each, each person, each infected person needs to infect less than one other person. They they should replace themselves less than one. And if you do that, um, you know, you will slowly bring the epidemic to a close. And the th- there's three factors that, that determine whether that's going to happen. The first is the prevalence of the disease in the population, the percentage of people who are infectious. The second is the infectivity of that disease, and the third is the contact rate. Prevalence is the percentage of people in the population that are infected. Obviously, that's important because if you're walking around in a population where one in 10 people are infectious, the risk is much higher than if one in 10,000 people are infectious. Um, Infectivity, the infectivity of the disease itself is important because if you have something that you have a, you know, 80% chance of catching it from sitting with somebody for 10 minutes, there's going to be a lot more infection than if you only have a 1% chance of getting infected if you're sitting with somebody for 10 minutes. So infectivity is hugely important. And the contact rate is the rate at which people come together in a way that could spread the disease. And that is important because obviously if you live like in a big city where you might come into contact with 800 people in a single day, there's a lot more opportunity for the disease to spread than in, you know, if you live out in the woods where you only come in contact with five people in a day. So those three things, prevalence, infectivity, contact rate, are the three key things. And we need, if you have a disaster like COVID, um, you need to address all three. So that's what we do, or that's what we're supposed to do. That's what successful countries have done. The people address prevalence through um, testing, contact tracing, and isolation. You test people, you find out who's infected, and you remove them temporarily from the population. And every time you do that, you reduce the prevalence of the disease in the population by one person. But if you've got, say, if you've got a town where you're able to find 80% of the infected people and put them into temporary isolation, you've reduced infectivity by 80%. That's really good. That, you know, you can make a gigantic, you know, dent in that. You address infectivity, well, with COVID, you address infectivity with things like masks. Wearing a mask reduces infectivity per contact. Washing your hands reduces it per contact. Staying six feet apart from people, meeting outdoors rather than indoors. Those are all um, tactics to reduce infectivity when a susceptible person and an infectious person do come together. And in a sexually transmitted disease like HIV, that was the purpose of condoms, was to reduce infectivity per contact. And today with HIV, we have these new you know, biomedical interventions like PrEP and treatment as prevention and PAP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And those also are all designed to reduce infectivity per contact. And then the contact rate itself that's why we had the shutdown. You know, we shut down our entire society and shut down our whole economy in order to reduce the contact rate. The contact rate is key. Contact rate is the river upon which human-to-human disease transmission flows. And you can, if you interrupt that, um, you know, you're going to stop transmission. It's a very crude instrument because you don't just stop disease transmission, you stop everything, you know. Uh, You stop economic activity, you stop family life, you stop social activity. It's almost sort of like um, um, chemotherapy with cancer. You know, it kills the cancer, but it also kills all the good things, and you feel horribly sick and your hair falls out and all that stuff. But it does work. So those are the three things to, to address prevalence, infectivity, and contact rate. And we haven't done much of that. We, we did the contact rate thing in the United States by shutting everything down. So that was a blunt instrument and it worked. But we have not brought prevalence down by testing, contact tracing, and isolating people. Um, 
uh, we just haven't done it. And as far as infectivity, um, mandating that everybody wear masks, that everybody stay six feet apart, that people not meet in indoors in close quarters like restaurants and things like that, we kind of half-heartedly kind of did that. Um, but we didn't really do it. We didn't do it the way that they have done it in other countries. So um, one of the three things we did kind of strongly for a while, the shutdown, the other two we hardly did at all. And as a result, we have not successfully, you know, addressed the epidemic. In the, in the gay world, we had a, in, in the, you know, for amongst gay men with HIV, we had a different issues back then. And the reason that we failed is slightly different. We could not address prevalence in the AIDS epidemic. Prevalence was off the table. You could not round up people who were HIV positive and put them into isolation because HIV, unlike most diseases, HIV is a lifelong infection. Um, so isolating people temporarily while they go through two or three or four weeks of COVID infection and then they recover and they're no longer infectious um, and, you know, and then they can go back about their business, you couldn't really do that with HIV. So one of the major of the three huge pillars of prevention, one of them was off the table from the beginning and everybody accepted. I mean, there were actually, there were some right wing you know, freaks who wanted to put all gay people in concentration camps and all that kind of thing, but that never was seriously contemplated by anybody seriously. So that was off the table for a very good reason, um, but it meant that we had to stress the other two things, the other two things being infectivity and contact rate. Infectivity was condoms. We did a good job, 60% condom compliance, but it wasn't enough. Um, and we still had our, you know, our naught was still a little bit above one, even with 60% condom compliance. And then the third thing, which was contact rate, was reducing, um, in, in the case of a sexually transmitted disease, that would mean reducing your number of sexual partners across the population. And that we did not do. Um, that was not advocated. People thought that that was um, sex negative and anti-gay, and anybody who advocated that a way to help bring HIV under control was to urge people to reduce their partners was engaging in some sort of right-wing, um, you know, agenda um, coming. If they were gay and they were saying that, they were probably self-loathing or anti-sex or, you know, that kind of thing. And so that was just not put on the table. Um, so we were putting all of our eggs in the basket of infectivity, um, which is in those days was condoms, and we're still basically doing that, but now we have um, PrEP and, you know, treatment is prevention and pre post-exposure prophylaxis, but it's all still just attacking the epidemic just at the infectivity leg of the triad of risk. Um, we don't address prevalence because we can't, and we don't address the contact rate because apparently we don't want to. Um, and, and trying to solve an epidemic like HIV by attacking it at just one of the three major points is not likely to work unless you're incredibly lucky, and we haven't been incredibly lucky. Mm. But isn't that also due to, um, uh, you know, as a, as a population, we're sort of... Um uh, spoiled. We have kind of an addiction to all of these uh, things that we do. So, you know, people just don't, either they don't want to believe it or they just sort of, don't, I don't know, they just don't do it. So they'll have sex without protection or they'll uh, not wear a mask in, in this case. Like there's, there, we just, we just seem to be uh, addicted to comfort. Yeah. I mean, some people some people make that argument. I you know I wouldn't draw too many parallels between the um, the failure of of you know of people Americans in general to um, bring COVID under control and the failure of gay men to bring HIV under control because HIV is a lot harder to do. It's right. a lot harder to do. Um, it it really is. I mean. 
uh, I won't go into all the technical details, but just, just the fact that HIV is a lifelong infection means that you have a cumulative prevalence that just keeps growing and growing and growing, whereas with COVID, people recover from it and cease to be infectious in usually just a few weeks or maybe at the most a couple of months, and then they just are out of the equation and, and also are now um, probably um, immune to it. But with HIV, it just grows like a you know, snowball rolling downhill, so that's much harder. And... Um, you know, in a, in a sexually stigmatized population where people have a lot of shame and all that kind of thing that gay men have been burdened with, you know, forever, um, expecting people to change their sexual behavior without a tremendous amount of support um, wasn't really that likely to happen. Whereas just asking people to wear a mask for COVID, I mean, that's just <laughs> so simple. You know, what is the big deal with that, and, and the government, you know, setting up a vast system of what's called, you know, TTSI, tracing, t testing, tracing, and supported isolation, where you keep testing people uh, for COVID. If you find somebody who's positive, you contact trace them and test those people. And if people then need to be isolated, which they do if they're infectious, you support them in that. You make sure that they're comfortable. If they can't, uh, do it at home because they live with a large family and they're just going to infect everybody in their family, then, you know, the, the government takes over hotels, most of which are empty right now anyway, and turns them basically into isolation centers. They're very comfortable. You get three meals a day. You got your cable TV. You get medical care. You get tested constantly. And as soon as you test negative again, they, you know, you can leave. Um, that's easy. I mean, that's relatively easy for, for a country that put people on the moon and can and seem to have no problem fighting gigantic wars, you know, all over the planet and maintain a military with millions of people and all that stuff. Doing something like that you would think would be pretty simple to do. Um, but we're not doing it. They're doing it in Italy. They're doing it in Australia. They're doing it in Canada. Um, they're doing it in China, even a country that's three times bigger than the United States. But we don't seem to be able to do it here, so it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, libraries of books will be written in the future about the colossal failure of um, uh, Americans across the board, the American government, state governments. I mean, look at California. I'm sitting here in Los Angeles. We were doing really, really well. In Los Angeles, it is a completely democratic-run state. Our entire state government is run not by Donald Trump and Republicans, but by progressive Democrats. And we were doing quite well. And then they just decided to reopen um, things before they were really ready. You're getting a lot of pressure from business. Well, you really need to do this. And they were like, well, we haven't met our benchmarks yet of how low new infections need to be, and we haven't set in place our testing, tracing, and supported isolation, all that stuff. And I said, oh, no, let's just do it anyway. But they did it, and boom, you know, we almost immediately shot to the top of the heap in terms of horrific new infections and whole areas of the state just devastated by COVID. So how to explain that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not good. No, human nature. When you wrote this book, um, Sexual Ecology, uh, what were you hoping to get across to people? Like, what did you want them to walk away with? Well, I wanted people to understand um, epidemiology, frankly. I mean, we had not, in those days, people looked at AIDS prevention from a purely personal point of view. And when you look at an epidemic, there's two ways to look at prevention. One way is the personal point of view, which basically is how do I make sure that I do not contribute to a transmission, meaning if I'm negative, how do I not get infected, and if I'm positive, how do I avoid affecting, infecting my partner? That's the personal side of, of prevention in an epidemic. But the collective side of prevention is how do we bring our naught down below one and keep it there for a long, long time in order to actually bring the epidemic to an end. 
And that public, communal, population-wide side of prevention was not something that we ever talked about in in the gay world at the height of the AIDS epidemic. People didn't even know about it. I didn't even know about it until I began, you know, as a journalist, began studying it relatively late in the game, in the in the early to mid-90s. But all during the 80s, no, that wasn't a thing. And then we saw that, that prevention was failing. At first we thought it was succeeding. In the 80s, um, new infections came way, way down after 1985, 1986. We thought that it was because we had, you know, come up with a solution, which was condoms. Um, and we thought that all we needed to do prevention from then on was just, just promote condoms and make sure there's free condoms in every bar and people hand out condoms on the street and condoms here, condoms there, and that's the solution. And then in the early 90s, it became clear that that was not working and that the younger generation was going to become as saturated with HIV as my generation had been. It was going to take a little longer, but it was eventually going to happen. And I wanted to know why. And when I began researching it and began talking to epidemiologists and discovering all these epidemiological principles, I wanted to um, to help educate, you know, my community about what I myself had learned about it. So my goal was to do that, and, and in particular to um, alert people to the fact that if we couldn't do any better with condoms than we were doing and we could not address prevalence by, and we're not going to address prevalence and did not want to address prevalence by putting everybody that was positive into, you know, quarantine, then the third thing, which is contact rate, which is lowering the contact rate, was something that we needed to do. And... Um, I did not think that most people knew that or thought that that was important in any way. Um, and so I, in part, wrote the book um, to alert people to the fact that we needed to add something new to our strategies of dealing with AIDS, and that new thing was that we needed to quite drastically reduce the contact rate, in the sexual contact rate in the gay world. Um, so that was what I was trying to get across. It did not. <laughs> it did not go over very well. <laughs> Let's put it that way. No, it was no. not well received. Um, Why do you think so, that I mean, is? Like, like, well, but what do you think the, the the kickback was for? Like, why? I think. I mean, well, first of all, it was very well received in the scientific community, and you know, sexual ecology got fantastic reviews and. The New York Times and the Boston Globe and the Washington Post, and it was a notable book, and it was blah, blah, blah. But in the gay world, um, that message was, it was, especially in big cities, there was a difference, actually, interestingly enough, between the reception. Because I toured for about a year after that book came out, and it was all over the country, all over the place, defending it. And I really found that there was a big difference between um, the gay reaction in big cities versus the gay reaction in smaller cities and in towns. But in big cities, I think my own personal opinion is that when gay liberation happened in the late 60s and early 70s, it just happened to happen at a moment uh, when the sexual revolution was at its peak. And people came to think of multi-partnerism, um, bathhouses, and sex clubs, and cruising, and having, you know, tons and tons of partners as an essential part of what it meant to be a liberated gay man. Um, it just historically happened. If gay liberation had happened in 1933, that probably would not have been the case. But it just happened to happen when it did happen, and that is what happened. Um, the first battles that people fought after Stonewall were battles to allow um, them to go to bathhouses and bars and sex clubs and places like that without being hassled by and shut down by the police, etc. People fought for that. It was a very passionate battle. And so people came to really, really closely associate um, promiscuity with what it meant to be a liberated gay 
person. And now along comes HIV AIDS just basically 10 years later, not that much later. And the right wing immediately began to use AIDS as a bludgeon. Uh, people like Jesse Helms and, you know, people like that, Pat Buchanan, saying, aha, look, you got, you know, liberated to be gay and you began having all these multiple partners and being promiscuous and look what's happened, this horrific plague. And people in the gay world just reacted tremendously defensively to that and, you know, felt that they were under unbelievable attack, not only by the virus, but by people that were trying to use the virus to advance a moralistic, anti-gay agenda. So it just makes sense that people would be very, very, very defensive about that. And then another 10 years goes by, and along comes somebody like me, you know, writing a book like that and saying, well, actually, <laughs> you know, I mean, we're not, I'm, not, I'm totally pro-gay. I was had a million partners myself, but studying the science, if you want to be science-based, Yes, you know, having large numbers of multiple partners with anal sex, what, you know, that really did play a gigantic role, and it's continuing to play a gigantic role, and it will continue to play a gigantic role as far as we can see into the future until there is a vaccine or a, you know, a full-on cure for HIV and people can clear the virus. That was not going to be taken that well. People just reacted very emotionally to it. And anybody who said that, like me, people, you know, acted, felt like you were just being a traitor. You were going over to the dark side and you were mimicking and echoing what the right wing moralists and homophobes had been saying all along. So I guess in retrospect, when you look at it, it was a natural response. Um, and looking back at it now, I suppose there's nothing that anybody could really do about it. But um, at the end, it just it did continue. I mean, I basically said in sexual ecology, if we do not address contact rate and we keep putting all of our eggs into the infectivity basket and we don't address the contact rate leg of the triad, that things will just continue indefinitely like this into the future. Um, you know, here we are 23 years later. And things have continued like that. We still have it. It's almost uncanny that we still have just about exactly the same number of people in the United States, the vast majority of them, men who have sex with men, becoming infected with HIV today as we did back then. It's almost uncanny. You think that it would have just, by the natural laws of you know, variability that it would have gone up by 5,000 a year or dropped by 6,000 a year. It's, it's at the same level. It's exactly the same. It's shifted a little bit. It's no longer as white. It's no longer as urban. It has HIV transmission has become, for men who have sex with men, has become more of an issue for people of color, more of an issue for people in the South, um, less of an issue for white um, men who have sex with men in big cities like New York. Certain locations have done a really quite good job. New York has done a pretty good job um, of combining a very aggressive treatment. Um, you know, because treatment is prevention is a logical way to go. If you are on your antiretroviral drugs and you have driven your viral load down to undetectable levels, you cannot infect another person. So if you could just grab everybody who's, who's positive and get them on drugs and keep them on drugs and get them undetectable, not only are you saving their lives and saving their health, but you're also preventing new infections in that way. Um, and in certain places like New York City have, you know, launched really aggressive moves to do that, as well as very aggressive moves to get people who know that they're having lots of multiple partners to take PrEP. Um, and they've had success. That does work. I mean, if, every, if we did that all over the country, that probably would work. But, of course, it requires a, a governmental um, you know, apparatus that is essentially pro-LGBT and wants LGBT people to be healthy and is willing to put resources into doing that. And you don't really have that in the South and many places, most places probably in the South or in the Midwest. Um, you don't have that um, the way that our government just 
routinely deals with people of color and their health issues. We see that with COVID right now, always getting the, you know, the short end of the stick in terms of resources and help and assistance. And so HIV has sort of migrated to places where it finds fertile soil um, and has declined in places where there's a, you know, a strong reaction to it. But nonetheless, still about 38,000 new infections per year, vast majority of them men who have sex with men. So hmm. it's sad. It's, it's strange. I think that there's a lot of people that don't realize it as well. Like I, I, there's, a, there's a general thought that um, there isn't that kind of infection rate going on with HIV right now. Yes, absolutely. That's unquestionably true. Every time I say that, people challenge me, you know, at a dinner party. I have to pull out, you know, Google and say, here, look at the CDC, because um, people really don't, they don't believe it and they don't want to believe it. And, and, you know, part of that is because HIV is widely considered to be no longer a, a death sentence, no longer uniformly fatal. The death rate from it is actually quite low if you are under treatment. And so... Um, people who become infected uh, oftentimes don't even tell their friends and their family that they, you know, are infected because why tell people? Why put up with the stigma? There's a lot of stigma, too, uh, uh, against people that are HIV positive, and that has been a problem from the beginning, and it continues to be a problem today. Um, and we have not done much about that. So it's just been sort of swept under the rug. And um, if people were, were dying, you know, it, it couldn't be swept under the rug back in the late 80s and 90s. People were, they would show up with horrible splotches all over their body and looking like skeletons and being, you know, sent to the hospital and then dying. So you couldn't, you know, HIV outed more gay people than anything ever. Um, but now it doesn't really do that anymore. Now most people are, you know, undetectable virus in their bodies. If they if they know that they're infected and they're in treatment, are undetectable. Their health is good, and um, so most people just, you know, sweep it under the rug, and you know, nobody really cares about it anymore. So there's not much, I suppose, that you can that can really be done until we get a an actual cure. Um, and I don't really see a huge amount of progress. You know, in that department, people are making a lot of money from antiretroviral viral drugs. I mean, it's it's almost like the perfect drug from a drug company's point of view. You know, antiretrovirals because you have to take them every day for your, the rest of your life. If you came up with a cure, you know, you take an intense you know thing of the cure like hepatitis C. You have to take it for whatever it is like a few weeks or a month, and then bingo, you're cured. You don't have to take it anymore. But um, with HIV, you no, know, every single day for the rest of your life. So. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So, um, what's next for you? What are you What are you working on now? Well, you know, I'm a TV producer. I do documentaries for the History Channel, Discovery Channel. That's what I've been doing for like the last twenty years. But of course, we all got furloughed back in March because of of COVID. Um, there's lots of talk about how we're going to come back and that we are coming back and all that kind of thing, but everybody thought by now, and you and I are talking now in, in August, um, we really thought that by July the virus would be under control and we would be able to go back um, to work because a lot of what I do requires flying, you know, all over the country and really all over the world, you know, when you're doing interviews and you're doing nature things and stuff, and nobody really wants to do that. Right now, as Americans, we're not even allowed to go anyplace <laughs> in the world where it's stuck. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I'm, I, but I had written a novel, a, a murder mystery uh, novel last year, and I got notes from a publisher on it, so I'm using this time to address those notes, and so I'm kind of happy as a clam just sitting here doing that, waiting yeah. for, um, you know, waiting for this to somehow end. Yeah, if it, it will. will. If it will. Yeah. If it will. Yeah. Well, it will. I mean... They always do. Yeah. Epidemics always, you know, eventually come to an end. There's not any epidemic in the history of the world that was around 100 years ago or 500 years ago that is still around today. And I, I actually think I'm, I'm relatively optimistic about 
COVID-19. I know that may sound crazy talking to you right now in August, but um, COVID-19, you know, this, this particular coronavirus, it's not that complicated, if you know what I mean. It's not, it's nothing like HIV. That's a lifelong embedded infection that actually attacks the very immune cells that are sent to, you know, to destroy it, attacks them and takes them over and then hides everywhere in your body, in your bone marrow, in your brain. You know, I mean, HIV is just the absolute worst, craziest, like designed by like a mad genius. Coronavirus, this COVID is, is nothing like that. It's relatively simple, and I do think that um, vaccines will be quite effective against it, and I also think that they are rapidly making progress in discovering therapeutics that will drive the death rate from it down to a level that will be comparable uh, to the average you know, annual flu. And once that happens, bingo, it's over. You know, I mean, it'll still be around. You could still get it, but you won't really, it won't really matter because if you get it and you become one of those people that starts to get super sick from it, you'll just take the um, the medications and you'll be fine. So I, I think that's going to happen, and I think it's probably going to happen relatively soon. So I'm not pessimistic about it. I think that we'll, you know, we'll be okay. The thing that I'm, you know, more worried about is the political situation and the economic situation um, and yeah. making sure that we solve this terrible, terrible political situation and somehow extricate ourselves from this horrific economic you know, depression that looks like we're going to be in. Um, and with Donald Trump in office, um, you know, I don't think those things are going to happen. <laughs> so, no, you know. no, 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 he's not capable of, of handling it. And uh mm -hmm. You yeah. know, but like, like, but you know, there could be something good that comes out of it. Like he said, the first Spanish flu uh, ended the Second World War. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, so? I have never known that. I always learn things from Donald Trump every time he opens his mouth. Um, usually, fascinating historical things, um, and that was one of them. Boy, that Spanish flu ending that World War. He's, um, I tell you, but... he's he's quite the genius. So, well, it's it's been a pleasure. I like I, it's been very informative, and I hope listeners enjoy that. I mean, I hope they get a lot out of it. Um, now, you have a website. Uh, it's at GabrielRitello dot com. Is that right? Or I do. I do I have to be honest with you. I I haven't gone on it and touched <laughs> it in a, in a really long time. But yes, I do, and you can see some of links to my TV shows and links to my books and my articles and all my various mishigash is on there. If people start going on and I'll maybe yeah. bestir myself to go on there and update it a little bit. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, we'll have that linked as well as your book. And uh, again, thank you very much for being on the show. Well, Al, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was great talking to you. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.